Welcome to Transformational Awakenings for the Health Conscious. My name is Carrie Rose and I am your health. Today I'm going to be talking to Linda Stead Miller. Linda is a classical homeopath with a busy practice of clients and students in Calgary, Alberta. She maintains certification by the Council for Homeopathic Certification and is a professional member of the Canadian Society of Homeopaths and the North American Society of Homeopaths. A vigorous interest in higher education in homeopathy in Calgary spawned the founding of the Western College of Homeopathic Medicine, www.wchm.ca, of which Linda Miller is the founding director. The college is the only one of its kind in Western Canada, offering a professional training program for homeopaths. It is on hiatus right now, currently, as we did this interview, but make sure if you're interested in learning about homeop- becoming a homeopath, you um, stay in touch with Linda for the next time that she offers this four-year um, program. Linda and I are gonna be talking today a little bit about the history of what homeopathic medicine is, as well as why it's not really well known in mainstream media, and possibly how it can give you the hope you may have been looking for when it comes to our current pandemic and the COVID-19 virus. Well, I'm delighted to talk about homeopathy. It is my favorite subject. And um, so I, yeah, the beginning of homeopathy is very interesting and very relevant for these times that we're in. The, the founder of homeopathy got homeopathy on the map worldwide, uh, like this is like 226 years ago, so long time ago, when he, because he was treating Napoleon's army, for typhoid and cholera, and he was treating scarlet fever epidemics, uh, and it was very successful. So, so that was the this infectious disease thing was the beginning of homeopathy. It had a very very strong start with that. So much so that before we even had a telephone, it made it w- its way over from Europe to the United States and was uh, very popular in the United States in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s. In fact, there were, there were homeopathic hospitals and colleges and uh, yeah, there was lots of homeopathy then. So what's the difference because there's homeopathy and allopathy, allopathy care. So are they related? Are they this? Are they, no, they, they have are a similarity? Opposite sides of the spectrum. So, so homeopathy. Homeopathy means uh, similar suffering. It's from the Greek. Allopathy means contrary suffering. So, in allopathic medicine, which is the medicine that is known as Western conventional medicine, what we do for let's say diarrhea, for example, is we give something to counter, to stop the body's uh, uh, purgative um, diarrhea. That's what it means. It's like it uses contraries to force the body to stop doing what it's doing or to do something else. In, In homeopathy, we use like cures like it's the foundation and so we give a very minute dose of a substance that would cause the very thing that's going on if if a person was poisoned with that now we always give it in a non-toxic form and so and it works then by the law of similar so it stimulates the body to correct that that diarrhea or whatever it is by the law of similars rather than force the body to stop doing it and then of course you force the body to stop doing something there's going to be a backlash and you have to keep the drug coming in you know to to maintain that whereas with the homeopathic approach you get the body to fix it 
Now, could that be, and, and bring me back in if I go off on tangents, like, cause I just love this conversation. Like I love people, I want people to kind of learn as much. So I'm going to ask questions that somebody who might be listening might have the same, same questions, but when you were just explaining that, and so if I'm using conventional medicine, what people would be prescribed by their doctors right now, or just even picking up in a drugstore, Mm -hmm. like it's so that are, they're available widely known things that people use every day if it's going against what our body naturally wants to do what our consciousness wants to do to get rid of let's use it keep the diarrhea framework if i have diarrhea my body is probably trying to get rid of something that's annoying or irritating or poisonous so if i'm doing something to stop that process could that be why there's so many side effects? Because as soon as I stop down that communication, my body still needs to express or to get rid of whatever's annoying it in the first place. So maybe that's when I might get a rash or I might get throw up or I might get constipated or there's, there's always, I'm assuming there's always going to be a side effect if I'm not honoring my body's natural rhythms. Would that be fair to say? Yes, that is fair to say. There are side effects that are part of every every drug that is, you know, either an OTC or or a prescription med uh, from conventional medicine. It's it's the field of toxicology. All of those drugs have a lethal dose that they are by definition toxic, and so so you are introducing a toxic toxic drug that is known to do something. Uh, but when it's doing that something, it's not only going to do that something, it's going to have other effects. And they're, no, they're known as side effects. They're just effects. They're, it's just we call it a side effect if it's not what they're taking it for. Right. Um, but, you know, all of those medications have that. But because of their definition of that is toxic, but also because their action is contrary to what the body is doing. And now, whereas it sounds like, oh yeah, well, if I have diarrhea, I want it to stop. Yes, you do. Um, but, but if you force it to stop, like you said, um, going against the body's wisdom, you force it to stop without correcting something then you're, you're going to have a whole lot of other uh, downstream effects from, from that. No pun intended with the downstream yes. effects. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. No, I love it. So, okay. So then let's now that now let's flip the coin um, effects of using homeopathy remedies. So there are no side effects basically what with homeopathy, because a, it, they are, all of them, by definition, non-toxic. There is no way you can poison yourself with a homeopathic remedy. Um, it doesn't even, it doesn't matter what the starting substance is. By the time it is in the form that is in, in the little vial of medicine, it is non-toxic by definition. So you don't have that problem of, I'm, t I'm taking a toxic substance. If the remedy is not a good match for what's going on with you by the law of similars, it usually just flows right through as like nothing happened. If it is a good match, then you will begin to see a healing reaction right away. Uh, and where, where the body starts to sort itself out. Uh, okay, so this, this diarrhea slows down. It slows down in frequency and intensity and then eventually stops. Um, but it's, 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 a di it's an entirely different process when you are stimulating the body to correct itself. Absolutely. I just want to interject it with uh, two, two little stories that bring to point what we're talking about right now. Um, one is I have, um, I'm, I have a sister, she's 11 months older than me, and um, she was born with some physical um, disability. She was, she's deaf and she was legally, she is legally blind. And um, she's had a really tough go at life. 
And at one point during her lifetime, um, she, she took um, intentionally, she took too much Tylenol and had, and, and ended up in the hospital. And um, from that moment on, she's had um, brain damage. And the doctors told us that this would happen. This was a very common, this is very common. The toxicity of the Tylenol, something that anybody can go, we probably all have it in our medicine cabinet. Um, so a warning for people out there, just because you can buy something on a counter doesn't mean that it's not dangerous. And I don't even know that Tylenol would be approved by any kind of um, regulation boards nowadays because it is very toxic. So I have that story. So my sister who has permanent brain damage now, and then I have another story. I met Linda. I, I met her um, when I was looking for alternative ways to help my kids. My oldest child um, had vaccine injuries and whatnot, and I wanted to find an ulterior way to support the health of my children. And so I ended up studying with Linda. But um, so I was really, really involved using homeopathic remedies with my family. And I had a kit and in that kit, I think there was like 30 different remedies in there, easily accessible for first aid and acute issues um, for my, for I have three, three kids. Well, the kids love the remedies because they have a bit of a sugar base to them. And one day I, I walked into a bed, the bedroom and my youngest son had the kit open and was able to open up the vials and was just like shooting them down. <laughs> and if that would have been Tylenol, I don't know if he'd be with us today. I mean, he probably wouldn't have done that because it wouldn't have tasted so tasty. But there were no side effects. There was no ill effect from Owen taking these homeopathic remedies and eating them like candy. Mm -hmm. And how, how peaceful, how awesome does that feel in a mother's heart knowing, witnessing, seeing my sister, what she's gone through and her trials and tribulations in this life. Mm -hmm. And then having that happen with my son and he's a okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yes. So that's just a little story that I can, I can share that just kind of brings home exactly what Linda's telling us today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the history of homeopathy. So I know that there was there were schools in in America and that the the population actually it was closer to 50 50 percent about like who went allopathy and who went homeopathy as far as what they were using. Mm -hmm. So what happened? What happened with the Spanish flu? Well. 1918, of course, we know that date for the Spanish flu. Uh, if you were fortunate enough to be in the care of a homeopath, you, the uh, the death rate was 1%. Whereas if you did not have an, a, a homeopathic doctor, you had a regular doctor, your, your, the death rate was 28%. And that is documented in numerous uh, journals, homeopathic journals that, that were published after that time when doctors started to report what they saw, how they treated people and what their, what their death rates were. So again, infectious disease. Wow. Homeopathy is so good at that. Um, especially viral disease. Whereas since we've had antibiotics, we know, we know that we can use those pretty successfully against bacterial kinds of, of infections. Although we can use homeopathy for bacterial infections also, um, where they seem to really outshine everything else is viral illness. Because, and this is also why in conventional medicine, they put so much emphasis on trying to find vaccines because their ability to deal with viral illness is not very good. So they try and, and uh, mitigate that problem by developing vaccines. But in homeopathy, we've always been very effective in treating uh, viral illness. 
So a question I have then is, so homeopathy is like and like, mm -hmm. and so you're, and so wouldn't a vaccine be that too? No, because a vaccine is, is got, it's got toxic elements in it. It has a uh, live or attenuated virus in it. And this, these particular vaccines that we've got, we've got mRNA and we've got spike proteins. Uh, these things are are delivered um, in a way that the body is is going to react like it's all an invader. Um, when we when we do homeopathy, first of all, nothing is in that material toxic form. If I make a remedy out of a virus, and this we we have lots of remedies like that. They're called nosodes. I dilute it such that there is no possibility of infection. There is no possibility of reactivity to that uh, viral material the way that it happens with vaccines. Vaccines also sort of blow a hole in the door of your castle, right? Beca in, this, in the wall, rather, of your castle, because you've now injected something. So the body has a very, um, very concerted effort any time the skin is broken and something is injected. The only other time we get a disease that way is is through IV drug use or or some kind of um, injection, uh, some kind of breaking of the skin, which we know is 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 bad. Um, in in homeopathic medicine, again, it's not in that form that ha has that toxicity to it, and and it's delivered orally. Uh, under the tongue. So you're not, you're going through the pathway of entry that is the natural pathway of entry, the the way we get sick, through our nose, throat, down, you know, down through the, past the tonsils, the adenoids, already the immune system is reacting, uh, the thymus gland, and so on. That's the normal way that we get something. And, and when we take a homeopathic remedy, that's the way we take it. Right. I, I, I often think about, you know, our body, we have these layers of defense that we're not even aware of from the cilia in our nose, the little hairs in our nose yeah. that capture the viruses and back. I mean, we're exposed as human beings, we're exposed to billions of yes. other living identities, identities, all the time they're living on our skin and our eyelashes there we're breathing them we're eating them we're our micro microdome of our our stomach has more living cells in it that are not part of our dna than we have in our entire dna altogether so it's not like viruses are new and bacteria is new and we, our body in this miraculous way that we've been developed and formed, we have these layers of defense systems. Yes, we do. So I agree, like injecting something right into the bloodstream is so, that's not how we were made. No, it's not. And it's, it's just um, playing with unknown, unknown factors about how, the body's going to re react to that. Right, right. So because I, I hold you on this pedestal and in such high regard and, and in your career and, and what you've done, how did you, how did you first get introduced to homeopathy? Like what was your entrance to this entire paradigm of health? Well, um, the first the first time I saw what homeopathy could do was when my youngest daughter was about four and a half. Uh, she got chicken pox. I was not a homeopath or a homeopathic student at that time, but I was seeing a chiropractor and I said, oh, my daughter's got chicken pox. And he said, oh, well, you need to go get Russ Toxicodendron. And I was like, well, you need to spell that. 
Um, <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> anyway, Ras Toxicodendron is the long Latin word for poison ivy. And I, I didn't look it up or anything. I just trusted him. And so I, I went and got it. And I, I was really excited about this because I was living in a house with another family of four children. And they all had the chicken pox at the same time as my, my little four and a half year old. So, oh my God, we have so many pox. Like, <laughs> <coughs> oh, pardon me. So, I started giving my daughter this remedy and I offered it to my neighbor. She didn't know what it was. She didn't want to use it. So she declined. So I gave it to my daughter and I saw the difference. So that, you know, all the kids kind of got sick around the same time as happens with, the, with that sort of thing. Yep. My daughter just got, she started to get better. She stopped getting so many pox. They weren't so itchy. She wasn't so miserable. The other kids, oh my God, that it went on for much longer and they kept getting bigger spots on their spots and infected spots. And the, you know, the, the, the wafting calamine from them kept <laughs> going. Whereas with us, you know, she's like, Oh, she was fine. That's awesome. So I saw that and I went, wow, interesting. And I didn't even know that it was poison ivy because I didn't look it up. But if you think about it, if you think about the law of similars, okay, if you get in the poison ivy, it those those uh, little bumps kind of look like chicken pox. They're, they're little vesicles with, filled with fluid. So it makes perfect sense by the law of similars. However, it's not going to be a solution to stick your poxy child in the, you know, poison ivy, the poison ivy right? <laughs> <laughs> you might have, you might have some people knocking at your door if you do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not recommending that at all. But, but you see, by, by making it into a homeopathic remedy, I got the value of the similar without the toxicity and so awesome. i saw it working i was like wow this is cool then i i got a book on, on homeopathy and i started to use it a little bit more for my myself and my family but that was a long time before um before what happened that that led me really into my profession as a homeopath was my daughter and I had a health food store and it was called Zerion and it was called Zerion health food. And I was helping her and I found people coming in asking me ridiculous questions. Like <laughs> what do you have for Crohn's? I'm like, why are you asking me that question? I, you should not be asking me that question. I should not be giving, trying to give you advice like that for, for chronic illness, for heaven's sakes. I was, I was shocked, but then I realized that, that the health food store was kind of the opening for people to, to, cause they were, they were desperate. For they were something. searching. They're searching. So they're like, Oh, I'm going to ask this girl in the health food store. So, so after that went on for a bit, I thought, you know, I need some training. People are going to start asking me this stuff. And now I had a certain amount of, of knowledge about, you know, taking vitamin C and, and diet and those kinds of things, because I inherited that from my, my mother and grandmother. However, I didn't know anything about homeopathy except, you know, my rust toxicodendron experience. So, I, um, I decided to enroll in a course and I thought I'll just, okay, I'm just going to take one year of this course and then I'll know we can use this for this and that for that and, and so on. But what happened was I realized that the potential of this medicine was not just 
use this for this and that for that. It had a far greater potential at reaching people on, on deeper levels where healing was required. And once I understood that, you know, homeopathy was not just a lake, homeopathy was like an ocean of possibility. I, I was just headlong into that program. I, I did extra work, uh, sitting with a veterinary homeopath. I, I did this, this, uh, huge, uh, write up for, for fourth year on a new homeopathic medicine that I participated in the proving of, and I just gave it my whole heart and soul. I love it. <clears throat> I love it. So that's one thing that besides Linda being a homeopath, she's actually also developed remedies um, um, to help with the different things. So how many remedies have you developed or been oh, a part of? Well, um, I, I had a hand in the development of Mozzie Q. I also had a hand in the development of a cervical dysplasia formula. Um, most okay. recently, I have, uh, I have developed a formula for vaccinosis uh, because vaccine ill effects of vaccines have been part of the homeopathic lexicon for as long as we've had vaccination efforts. So all the way back to Jenner when he was doing smallpox vaccination. We have been there uh, treating people from lasting ill effects from vaccination. So in my practice, I didn't really expect this, but a lot of people started to come to me for assistance with vac their vaccine damaged children. That's how I met you. Yep. This, this was, no, I did not expect this. I didn't know this was a thing because by this time, my children were grown and you know, uh, this is something that has come out of, like, from the time we had the MMR vaccine, which was mandated, I believe, in 1983. Uh, we've had it since about 1979. And that, that along with the, the how the vaccine industry has bloomed, has created, made much more of an issue than I had directly with my children. So I didn't, I didn't know it was a thing. However, my colleague, Randall Powell and I gave seminars for five years about what is in the vaccine. You know, what do, do you know why this, this can be harmful? And then we had all these people coming. I, I, I had no idea. It, we had people coming saying, I vaccinated my first child and this is what happened. So therefore I stopped and I'm not vaccinating uh, since. And you know, they told us their stories. So we learned from, from the people yeah. about what was happening with their children. Yeah. So if for any listeners out there, if you yourself or your children or someone you know, if you think that you've had a vaccine injury, um, there is help for you. There is help and it's very important to report it, even though it's very difficult to get the message through to uh, your your family doctor or whoever it is that, that gave the vaccination. It's very difficult to do that. There are ways of reporting it yourself, um, but it's important because there's a whole chunk of information that is, you know, that, that, that the public really needs. I agree. I agree. What we don't know is going to hurt us mm. more than what we do know. And if, if people aren't expressing their, um, experience if they're not sharing their experience and then then how can them even the medical system improve if they don't get all the information 
so, yes, absolutely. You, yeah. Your your doctor needs to know. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, they they don't have they don't have that very critical information, even if they seem to um, not respond. You have put it in front of them. That's right. And the more often that happens, the more likely they are to to notice. Absolutely. So speaking of the vaccine um, remedies right now, now um, let's let's just talk about what's going on in the world right now. Obviously, we're in the middle, still dealing with COVID, and vaccines have come out. So there's four that I'm aware of so far. Um, so with a remedy, with a, if somebody came to you, would they take? Would you suggest a remedy post vaccine, depending on what they got, or will it always go by what symptoms they're experiencing? Well, the answer is yes and yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I I do specific detoxification based on what vaccine they have received. But there are, you know, there are remedies generally that we know for vaccinosis, as I said, uh, and I, I match with what's going on with them specifically. Yeah. Not everybody's going to have the same reaction. Right. That's, that's what I thought. And then, so, and so then let's go, go back a little bit in time. We're all hanging around in December 2019 and we get together for Christmas and everything's good and we start hearing little tid little things nickering in the back of our head about this virus, this deadly virus and that's happened that's in China and and all of a sudden come March COVID, everyone knows what COVID is and it's affecting people all over the world. Now there was a study done that I would like you to share with us. Um, because I'd like to know of this particular remedy from the Cuban study. Is this something that you would take as a preventative or is this something that you would take if you have acquired COVID, the virus? Well, it could be, it could be either. Okay. Um, the, so this study was done at the very outset of, of COVID. Um, the very beginning. So what they did was they gave a combination of remedies that were a match by the law of similars with how they were he hearing that people were falling ill with this virus. And they gave it to a million families. And then they followed them. And a year a year of doing that, they published the results. They are crazy successful. If anybody wants to see that study, I'm more than happy to provide it. Um, since Cuba started vaccinating, unfortunately, their numbers have gone up. Because they wanted to get in the vaccine game, you know, like everybody right. else. Um, right. <clears throat> but the, the homeoprophylaxis performed extremely well. And the study lists what, what, what's in that combination. On top of that, um, I knew what the potencies were, so I have mimicked that formula. Great. And I, uh, it can be used to protect against COVID. But what I think is more important <clears throat> is that it will be protective against variants. Because what we're going to see, what we've already seen, uh, what's going to happen more and more are people, whether they've had the vaccine or not, are going to have variants because the vaccination effort enhances the virus, it makes it want to mutate. That's what ma makes it bigger and worse. Uh, we've seen that phenomenon in in other other scenarios like with overuse of antibiotics we have superbugs um this is kind of like that uh so i am i am confident because i understand how homeopathy works and that this this uh combination of remedies will be effective against variants 
Listeners, did you hear that? <laughs> did you hear that? If you find that you are suffering from effects of being subjected to the COVID virus, there are options for you and you do not need to necessarily live in fear. There are options out there for you. And I think that that's really, really important to get that message across. So listeners, please take note. <laughs> there is help out there for you. Linda, a question that I have that, so if I have it, then I'm sure other people have it. Why, why is this not mainstream knowledge? Why, why, reason why ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine are, were made, you know, vilified and unavailable because mm -hmm. if you have treatment, then you cannot go as far as mandating your vaccine. Exactly. So it, the other, the other piece of it is that homeopathy really lives underground. Um, it's, because it is an effective alternative, it has been targeted for a good deal of the last uh, 100 years as being quackery. Um, it's amazing. It, it lives on anyway, which is a testament to its effectiveness because people don't, people People will not be swayed by hearsay when they their experience is otherwise. That's right. So, you know, that's eventually. I mean, there there comes a point where you connect the dots and you go, oh my God. Okay. Well, I don't know. It worked for me. Okay, you say it can't work. You but uh, it worked for me. Right. So so that's where I stand on it. And I'm going to ask for more. I'm going to ask for help, you know, with homeopathy if I need it. Because that, it worked for me. Yeah, not totally. Because, not because I believe in it. It's because, no, I had this experience that was very clear. Yeah. And then the naysayers, well, it's just placebo. My response now, because... I'm told that a lot about a lot of different things. Oh, it's just placebo. There's no, there's no proof. There's no blah, blah. That's not science or which is like BS, especially with homeopathy, because it is based on science as much of, as a lot of these things are. But I'm like, yeah, okay. If it's placebo, that's okay. But whatever, if it works, if I feel better, who cares? You can call it whatever you want. <laughs> right? Right. But, right. Well, I would just, you know, Again, there's just a lot of folks who they just shake their head and you say, you, you know, I didn't, I didn't even expect this to work or, or I gave it, I gave a remedy to my dog. Now, <clears throat> this is very cool. When you see homeopathy work in animals, you're just like, oh my God, mm -hmm. this is so beautiful because there's no placebo effect. You, you know, it's like it it's either working or it's not working. That's right. And you can't argue with it. The, the, the dog's not going, oh, I really hope I get better. You know, they're just like, what are you putting in my mouth? Right. Um, so, uh, yeah. That's I, awesome. And, you know, I, I used to, um, I used to say the placebo effect is everyone's friend, which is true. You know, there's always a piece of healing that has to do with the power of the mind. That's oh. important. However, that's that's not how, that's not the mechanism of action right. with homeopathy. And in fact, a homeopathy is is so advanced in its in its mechanism of action. We're only actually now beginning to understand it i i got an um uh, an email today from that that actually it's a study on on that very thing and and that our understanding now of nanopharmacology where where they're actually measuring what it is that is in that homeopathic remedy that is doing what it does 
So it's very exciting to see that that research come forward. That's awesome. Because that has been uh, that has been needed for sure. That is awesome. So if somebody wanted to find, I mean, you can go, I, we can go into our health food store and you can see the rack of different remedies and whatnot. And, but if what, how, what there, there's one option, but, and then there's homeopaths, natural paths, a lot of natural paths are trained in homeopathy. Um, but how does somebody find someone to help them on this journey? Liz? Well, we, we have an association called the Alberta Homeopathic Association here. And uh, that ha- that has professional homeopaths that are certified, etc. Uh, that's a good way to find a homeopath Great. in the area. Um, you know, there are many homeopaths in Alberta, in, in Canada, uh, all over the world. It, you just have to, you can just access them. Through, okay. through associations like the Alberta Homeopathic Association. Great. And then do you still, so again, I'll just remind the listeners, Linda was actually my instructor for I to get my um, first aid and acute care homeopath um, education mm-hmm. and invaluable, truly invaluable, in, just invaluable. It's something that I, <laughs> it's amazing. Um do, are you still teaching? Are you still part of the college? Yeah, well, I the the four year program is on hiatus at the moment. Uh, I my feeling was that twenty homeopaths in this area is a good number for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not sure when that's going to restart. I do teach uh, smaller courses that you know, like introductory courses, like the one you just mentioned. Yeah, I, I do continue to teach that. Yes. Great. So p- where can people find you then? Uh, well, people can find me at on my website, which is uh, Zarion Consulting Services dot co. Um, you can find me. Yeah. Great. We'll put that. We'll put the link to your website um, in the notes for the podcast here so people can find you easily. Thank you. And is there anything else that you would like to share that you think that would be beneficial for the people out there to know? Well, there is this issue of shedding. It's, I didn't believe it. I have to say, I did not believe that people were having bad reactions by being around and having close contact with people who had received the vaccine. And then I got enough reports of it, of, you know, women having extraordinary menstrual bleeding, um, a a number of different symptoms, but that is, that is sort of the, the most prevalent. So I, tweaked my vaccinosis formula after getting that information and I took it to a clinic where there was like all the female staff were, were being affected and it corrects the problem very, very quickly. It also can be used preventatively. So this is another, you know, there are, there are, there are uh, people making, pine tea and and so on which is also beneficial the thing about about homeopathic medicine is it it lasts for longer and i think that it will assist us to adapt to this strange new normal well i know even the, the, with the homeopath what we spoke about at the beginning there's no side effects with the homeopathic remedies and i've had people contact me um for pine oil and whatnot to make the the pine tea and you have to you you know you need to i don't want to say you have to be careful but you have to be aware of the formulation when you're doing this on your own and and there there's a, a recipe there's a method to it and so it's not as safe it's not as safe as using a homeopathic remedy yeah um so it's yeah so I just wanted to inter- interlay that too. The um, shedding, they're not even calling it shedding anymore. They're calling it transmission. Yes. 
I know. Like, so... It's um, a bizarre phenomenon, and I, you know, I didn't believe it at first. But yeah. I, I know I know that I just had too many people come to me about it. Oh, that's sad. And, and you know, they're, they're using... Either they're using the remedy and it's working well. So, That's awesome. I'm so I'm assuming if you're listening to this, you are wanting to have a transformational awakening and you are either wanting to be or you are conscious of health. And it's not just that you're living from that from that subconscious level of letting life happen to you, but you actually want to take part in your life and be a proactive actor in this play and thus you're listening to this right now and one of the best ways that you can do that is to go to the directory the alberta homeopathic directory find yourself a homeopathic um, practitioner and be proactive you want to be conscious of your health you want to don't let don't leave it to fate just don't leave it to fate do what you can for you for your children for the people that you love um, I know there's a, there's so many people that I care about so much and I, I'll tell you, Linda, it breaks my heart because people are tired and they don't want to have the conversations anymore and they don't want to read and they don't want to research and they, they're just doing things because they're told to do it. And, so, and we are, we are uh, bedraggled. We are. Exhausted. Done. Yeah. From this whole past year and a half you know it's really taken its toll on people yeah. and you know my heart goes out to to many who are just beyond stressed yeah and just want it to end yeah i call it psychological warfare yeah you know beat them down until they, there's nothing left to fight for and it's just e you want it, people want to take the easy route and i don't blame them i really don't blame them but if there's still a spark left inside of you, then this might be an option for you. So, yes. Yeah. I would say taking the vaccine is not the easy route. No. It might seem like it, but it's not. Not in the long run. No. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. I okay. really enjoyed talking to you. It's so good to have this connection again. It's been a few years, so... Yeah. I really appreciate, I know you're so busy, especially right now. You're probably busier than ever with what's going on. So I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today and to share your wisdom and knowledge and expertise. Because as I said, there's, there's no other, there's no other like my Linda. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Carrie. I do, I do appreciate the work that you're doing here. And um, it's been lovely to chat with you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Linda, for chatting with me today. You can find Linda at zerionconsultingservices.co. That's X-E-R-I-O-N consultingservices.co. Linda is a classical homeopath with over 15 years of experience working with families to help find solutions, solution-based, to their unique health concerns. So... Again, you can find Linda at zerionconsultingservices.co if you have any questions. If you would like to um, see a copy of the Cuban study that she has based her remedies on um, for the times that we're living through right now, we can get that to you as well. And if you're looking for any other mind-body connection, you're not quite ready to get, look into getting a homeopath for yourself, feel free to come contact carrierosehealth.com and we can um, start balancing that mind-body connection so that you can achieve the most optimal health and be as health conscious and awakened as you can be as you navigate your way through this beautiful life.